But today we're in chapter 24 here in Luke's gospel, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. And so I'll begin reading at verse 1, read to verse 12, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 24, we're looking at the first Easter. So beginning at verse 1, Luke writes, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. The resurrection. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. If you remove the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then our faith is absolutely useless. As a matter of fact, if you take notes, Paul said something about this in 1 Corinthians. When he was writing to the church of Corinth there in Greece, and he was speaking related to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he was writing to them in that 15th chapter, which is all about the resurrection, Paul, as he was speaking concerning that, said to them this. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 through 17, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Everything that you and I as believers, everything that we have in terms of our faith rests on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does it matter if Jesus was resurrected or if he remained in the grave? Absolutely. It matters absolutely because everything we stand for centers on the reality of the death of Christ, his burial, as well as his resurrection. There are various reasons why this is true. One thing, the first thing, is Jesus made clear and consistent statements that he would be raised from the dead. You see that from the beginning of his ministry throughout his ministry. On various times, he was clear and consistent in his statements that he would die, be buried, but raised on the third day. All the way back in John chapter 2, when he was first beginning his ministry, it's found in verses 19 and 20, Jesus was speaking to those who were already opposing him, and he said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? And John adds, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. From the very beginning, Jesus Christ was saying, that though his body would be killed, yet he would be raised from the dead. When you study Matthew in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 20, and Matthew chapter 26, uh, there are various passages in those chapters that speak about his betrayal, about his being judged, being crucified, and then he says he will be resurrected. And so his resurrection validates the truthfulness of his claims. Secondly, the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ rests on his resurrection. Jesus claimed to be God in human flesh, and his resurrection validates that claim. You see that when Paul is writing to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 4. He said, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. And so, one, he made clear and consistent statements that he'd be raised from the dead, Two, his divinity rests on his resurrection. Three, the lordship of Jesus Christ rests on his resurrection. 
because recognizing Jesus as Lord by faith evidences genuine salvation, a salvation that is won through Jesus conquering the grave and being resurrected. In Romans 14, 9, Paul said, To this end Christ both died and rose, lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Our personal justification, our standing before God being not guilty, that's what justification speaks of, that God declares us to be not guilty. Our personal justification rests on his resurrection. Romans 4.25 says Jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Our own salvation depends on his resurrection. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul said, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Our own resurrection rests on whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead. Romans 8, 11 says, if the, if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive your mortal bodies by the spirit who dwells within you. So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his resurrection is... is what our faith is, is, is holding fast to and is founded on, it's built on whether Jesus Christ died, was buried, and actually was resurrected. His entire ministry rests on whether or not he was raised from the dead. There was a young girl who claimed that she had been impregnated by the Spirit of God. Well, she's from a small village. Just a handful of people lived there. They knew that she had left for a small period of time and had gone to visit a relative of hers. They knew also that she had yet to be married, officially married to the man that she had been engaged to, a man by the name of Joseph. And yet when Mary left and returned from her short visit, she came back pregnant. And the people during that day are no different than the people today. I mean, there's only one way that you could become pregnant in a more natural sense. And uh, obviously, you went out on, on your betrothed husband. You're guilty. According to Jewish law at that time, a woman who violated her betrothal was um, capable of being put to death. Joseph, the Bible tells us, was a, a just man. He was a righteous man. And so as he discovered this woman that he was engaged to had become pregnant and he had nothing to do with it, he was pretty upset. He began to think, what should I do? And as he was thinking of these things, the angel spoke to him and said, don't be afraid to take this woman to be your wife because she has conceived by the Spirit of God. God himself has caused life to be formed in her womb. And so Joseph was willing to take to himself a woman who, according to Jewish law, could have been put to death, and he remained with her until he eventually died and went to be with the Lord. But she continued on. And as Mary continued on, she grew older, and her son Jesus grew older. She had other children by Joseph, but people knew that that first one didn't look anything like his dad. And they were well aware of the fact that, uh, that Mary had... Uh, become pregnant before she had been married. In the ministry of Jesus, on occasion, Jesus would speak, and, and when they got angry, his opponents would, would actually throw that in, in his face. They, on one occasion, said in the Gospel of John, we have not been, not been born through fornication. We have one Father. And when they were saying that to him, they were saying, we're very, very acquainted with the story of you and how you came to be. And who are you to come and speak to us when you were born in the way that you were Mary had kept all of these things in her heart and pondered them through his entire lifetime. Jesus grew to be 33 years of age, and this, this young woman who probably at the age of 14 had become pregnant had for 33 years carried the stigma in her society of being an unwed mother when she gave birth to her first child. And people continually believed that she was guilty of great sin until the resurrection. Because in the resurrection, Mary herself was justified before all, that her son, even as she had said, was the Son of God, and that she had conceived through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Everything rests on the resurrection. 
Was Jesus Christ resurrected or not? Those who say he was not are still in their sins. Those who recognize him as being raised from the dead on our behalf that we might have life in him, those are the ones who are saved. And so what we're looking at is the resurrection. Now, as we begin here in chapter 24, notice as it says in verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the will of God, died voluntarily on a cross that he might be able to, to atone, that he might be able to satisfy the righteous demands of his Father and and pay the price, the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus took upon himself our, our sin. He died on our behalf, satisfied his Father's demands. He had been crucified. He died, and he had been buried. And that all took place on what we today call Good Friday. We, we read how that Joseph of Arimathea, and, and a man by the name of Nicodemus, had, had anointed his body and after taking it off of the cross and, and how they had placed it in Joseph's tomb. And, and we also read how that some of his, his followers had followed after and had seen where he was buried and, and they had left in order that they might prepare spices and oils. In verse 55 and 56 of chapter 23, it says, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. They observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And so they were waiting until the Sabbath was, was over. And so now Sabbath is over. It's the first day of the week, and, and they come, and they come to that tomb. And it says there on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. Now, as they come to that particular tomb there, verse 2 tells us they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, this was something completely unexpected. Mark tells us in chapter 16, verse 3, that as they were walking on their way there, there to that tomb, that they spoke amongst themselves and they said, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? I mean, they were discussing this. Who's going to get this huge stone uh, and, and move it out of the way for us? Because when you go to Israel, you'll see that that these tombs, there are many tombs like that. And we go into a, uh, into a particular tomb in a garden. It's called the garden tomb. And we go into that particular place and we have communion on the last day of our, our trips to Israel. And in that particular place, you'll see this. You can go and you can see that there is, out of the rock, there's been hewn a tomb. And, uh, and it actually has a uh, kind of a, uh, a rut or a groove that is on an incline. And what you have is you have like a, a ledge, and then uh, an incline going down, descending, and then out of the rock there, they actually cut out a groove, and what they would do is they'd get this huge 6,000-pound stone that it was in the shape of a wheel. They would put it on the ledge, and then they would place the person who was being buried inside of the tomb, and then they would just roll this particular huge 6,000-pound wheel down off the ledge, and it would just roll in to the groove there that's cut out on the side, and there's no way that, that women, that, that men and women are really going to be able to dislodge that. And these women are speaking amongst themselves. They're saying, who's going to roll that stone away for us? How's it going to be that we're going to be able to get in there and complete the burial? And so as they're speaking concerning that, um, the Bible makes it very clear that, that it says, and I want you to see this, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And, and the picture there is that it's actually out of its rut. It's as if a, a mighty force has, has blown it off of the hinges. And that's how it is. It's just they're off the rut there. As they get there, they see this, and it's been moved out for them, and it amazes them. And as they're looking at that, they didn't realize that what was going to take place. You see, they're asking the question, who's going to move this for us? Who's going to roll this away for us? Who's going to do this? But God was the one who took care of it. The stone had been rolled away before they came to the tomb because Matthew tells us in chapter 28, verse 2, that there was a great earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. And so as they're there, they see the evidence that this, 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 uh, this tomb has been opened up to them and it's absolutely amazing them. Well, as they step in, verse 3, they went in and they didn't find the body of Jesus. It's interesting that Luke records what they found as well as what they did not find. They found that the stone was rolled away. 
but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' body had been reanimated, had instantly been glorified, had passed through the grave clothes, leaving them flat, passed through solid stone, and had left the tomb completely empty. And so as they see this taking place, they're amazed. It says in verse 4, it, it, and, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Put yourself there for just a moment if you can. Imagine that. You have gone to a tomb expecting to find the body of somebody that you had seen die. But it's gone. And what would you be feeling like as you're standing there and it's dawn, it's very early in the morning, and you're absolutely just blowing your mind. You're thinking, what's going on here? What happened here? And, and as this is going on in your head, there's somebody speaking to you all of a sudden. Now, in verse 4, it says there are two men who stood by them in shining garments. These, these men are identified in Matthew chapter 28 as angels. One is speaking on behalf of both of them. And, and Luke describes them. He says their garments are shining. So they have the appearance of, of men. And it's interesting, I might as well say this. It says two men stood by them in shining garments. They have an appearance of men. You know, sometimes when we see pictures of, of angels and things, sometimes the angels look like women. And they weren't women. And, and sometimes you see these little baby angels, you know, and they weren't babies either. They were men. They looked like men. And so what you have here is you have, uh, you have this person there, these, these angels there who are, are beginning to speak to them and sharing with them what had took, taken place. So in verse 5 it says, As they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, <laughs> they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Now I, I have a habit of, of stopping for a moment at verses like this in verse 5. It says, they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth. I, I like to spend a moment just thinking about that, and I do so out loud before you, because I have heard over the years people speak about how they've had angelic visitations and this and that, and they speak very casually about it. You know, I, I, I have quoted this many times, you know, and some of you have heard me say it, but it's something that just has been lodged in my memory, how that um, people can, can act as if it's a casual, everyday experience to have an encounter with a heavenly being. I guarantee you that if an angel appeared to you, it would not be a casual conversation. I guarantee you, if an angel appeared, you wouldn't say, hey, what's happening? I guarantee you that would not happen. If an angel appeared to you, as I know what would happen to me, I would be frightened. I, I, I would be, oh my, my, my. I would be very scared, especially if I were there totally mourning, totally upset, totally believing that the body of Christ should be in that tomb, and now I'm surprised because uh, a stone has been blown off the door, and, and there's somebody I've never seen before speaking to me. Well, my immediate response would be fear, just as they in verse 5, they were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth. Now, as this is taking place, it just shows you the power and the glory of an angel. And, and, and they're not to be worshipped, by the way, and they're not, they're not somebody that I pray to, and, and, and they're not... Uh, they're, Hebrews chapter 1 tells me that the angels are ministering spirits who minister to those who are heirs of salvation. I mean, these are servants of God, and they actually are there to, to serve us because we're children of the King. But they're still glorious, and they're still awesome and very fear, fearsome, and that's what it is. And so these people are looking at them, and they're bowing their faces to the ground, and they're absolutely amazed at this. And as this is taking place, the angels speak to them. Now, notice the question in verse 5. Why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a great, great question. What's the thought? Well, Jesus is not to be thought of as dead. So why are you looking for his body? Why are you looking for a living person amongst the dead? 
Why are you looking for life here in the graveyard? You know, one of the things I think about in that question, you know, why do you seek the living among the dead? When I think about that, I also think in this way, the founders of all the world religions, every founder of every world religion that you can consider, whether it would be the Muslim, whether it would be various forms of, of, of philosophies that people hold fast to to this day, uh, Buddhism, all the world religions, they have one thing in common outside of Jesus Christ. They have one thing in common. They're all dead. Every one of them are dead. You can go somewhere and, and, and if the Lord were to make it possible, you could find the bones of Muhammad because he's dead. And you could find, uh, if, if it were possible, the Lord were to make this possible, you could find the bones of Buddha. He's dead. But you go into that tomb like these women are, and they're not going to find Jesus Christ's body because Christianity hinges on the reality of the fact that we do not worship a dead master, but a living Savior. And that is an entirely different way of looking at your faith. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is alive, and He ever lives to make intercession for us. And so when they ask the question, why are you seeking the living among the dead? That question can still be asked because there are people today who still are looking for life from those who are dead. I want to receive life from the one who's the author of life. And as a Christian, I have life through Jesus Christ who gives me life. And Jesus demonstrated to me the truthfulness of his doctrine in that he stated that he was going to be raised from the dead on the third day, and the third day came along, and Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. So I don't worship a dead teacher, but a living Savior. And when these angels ask that question, why do you seek the living among the dead is simply stating, listen, why are you in a graveyard looking for someone who doesn't belong here? He's alive. Now, when he says in verse 6, he's not here, he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. They bring to these women hope and, and, and security and comfort by reminding them of the teachings of Christ. The resurrection is something that he taught them. He taught them that when he was in Caesarea Philippi. You remember that story? Jesus and his disciples, it's found in Luke chapter 9. Jesus and his disciples were in the northern portion of Israel in a region called the Galilee. In the Galilee region, there's a place there called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is a beautiful, beautiful place uh, placed in the northern region there uh, going towards Mount Hermon. And in that particular area there, Jesus took his disciples in order that they might have some R&R. &R. And as they were there together, Jesus was seated there amongst his disciples in this beautiful location. Right behind him, there is a, is a hill. And in this hill, there's a cave. And that cave is there to this day. When we go to Israel, we go to Caesarea Philippi. This cave is still there to this day. Jesus is seated there with his disciples in a beautiful place. It's a park-like setting. As he's there, right behind him is a cave. This cave is, is, is deep, and um, the cave has is, is actually been called the Gates of Hell. And because there were those who believed that that was the entrance into the underworld. And so as Jesus is there ministering, and speaking to his disciples, in that cave, according to, to a pagan belief, Greek belief, the nature god, Pan, they believed, sprang into life. And so as Jesus is there, right behind him are the gates of hell, which they believed, these people, the pagans believed, you entered in and you actually went into, into the underworld. In that particular cave is a region that they believe that the nature god, Pan, sprang into existence. As Jesus is speaking, you can see the remnants of, of various temples that had been established there for the worship of the Syrophoenician god Baal. Plus, there was a temple that had been built there to, uh, for the Caesar worship. And so in the midst of all of this paganism and all of this kind of belief system, Jesus begins to speak to his disciples. And this is where he began to introduce them to more advanced teachings related to his resurrection. 
And that's when he said, who do men say that, that I, the Son of Man, am? And his disciples responded, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, others say one of the prophets. And so Jesus, when he was speaking to them, knowing that his disciples have been influenced by people in the world because people have opinions about him, even the church in the 21st century is still affected by what the world says about Christ, Jesus is asking at that time and says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, he's already given to them the clue and the answer because when he says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am, he actually supplied, it was like an open book test. You know, who do they say that I, the Son of Man, am? The Son of Man is a messianic title coming out of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And so when Jesus referred to himself, even in his question, and asked, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? He was supplying the answer for them. He was saying, I am Messiah. That's what he was, he was providing for them, the answer. But at the same time, he knows that they have been influenced by people in the world, and therefore he says, who do they say I am? Well, naturally, there's a response. Some say that you're John the Baptist. The reason they say some are saying that you're John the Baptist resurrected is because John the Baptist was a preacher of righteousness. The very first message that John ever gave is recorded as saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus made his, his, his ministry open and began to go out and preach, Matthew in chapter 4 tells us his first message was, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So people began to confuse him with John the Baptist. Herod at that time had believed that Jesus Christ was John whom, whom he had beheaded, come back to life. And so it was a common belief at that time that Jesus was John, and that's why some said they say you're John. Others said Elisha. Now, why would they say Elisha? The reason they would say Elisha is because Elijah in the Old Testament was a prophet God used to perform miracles. And Jesus Christ was a miracle worker. And so when Jesus was performing these miracles, they were saying, this has got to be Elijah. This has got to be Elijah. Come again and ministering to us. Some said he's Jeremiah. Why would they say Jeremiah? Because when you read the book of Jeremiah and you go into the Lamentations, you see that Jeremiah was a prophet who is known for his compassion. He was referred to as the weeping prophet. And it's Jesus who wept over Jerusalem. It's Jesus who cried over the grave of Lazarus when his best friend died. And they saw compassion in him. So they said, some say that you're John because your message of repentance reminds them of John. Some say that you're Elijah because your miracle-working power is reminiscent of the time of Elijah. Some say that you are Jeremiah because of your love for Israel and you're weeping over its soon destruction. And others say that you're one of the prophets. You're at least the man who brings the word of God to them. And that's how they're responding. So Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they say, these are the things that they're saying. But then he goes on and he says to them, but whom do you say that I am? It's not enough that you're able to repeat certain things that others are saying. I want to know what you think. And that's when the apostle Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's who you are. And that's when Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. My Father's revealed this unto you. He was saying to him, you did not ascertain this information through human reasoning. God revealed to you by His Spirit who I am. That's how you got saved, by the way. You were not convinced by some man that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus convinced you by His Spirit. He convicted you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and He opened your blind eyes so that you could see Jesus Christ. That's how that happened. It wasn't just because mom and dad prayed for us. It wasn't just because I had Sunday school experience. It was a working of God's Holy Spirit who opened my eyes to see who he is, convicting me so that I might come to him. And that's why Jesus said to him, flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you. My father in heaven, he's the one who revealed this unto you. And you are Simon, he says, but you're going to be called Peter. He says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell. And even as Jesus is there ministering right behind him is that pagan shrine that is called the gates of hell. And Jesus is saying, 
the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Why? Because the kingdom of God will advance. And that's when he began to share with them. That's when he began to say, as you see in verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Now, in verse 6, I want you to see something because the angel is bringing comfort to them. And here's something for you. Where does your comfort come from? It comes from God's Word. Your comfort will always come from the Word of God. Remember how He spoke to you, is what He says. Remember His words. Remember what He said. In Psalm 119, verse 50, the, the psalmist said, This is my comfort in my affliction. Your Word has given me life. I was with a friend of mine yesterday, uh, Randy Walls, pastor of Calvary Ch Chapel of, uh, of Upland. We had our, our ladies' um, moments with the master last night, and I understand it went really well. And Randy's wife, Jeanette, came and, uh, and lied to all the women for an hour. <laughs> Jeanette came and shared. And so Randy's been in Spain. I haven't seen him for a week, and so... Um, so we got together last night for some coffee, and so we went to a, a local uh, Starbucks, and as we were there, we were seated there, a young man was directly behind us, and, uh, and he was reading his Bible. And so I was getting the coffee because Randy made me buy, and so as I was getting the coffee, I put salt in his. But um, as I was getting the coffee, uh, I heard Randy say something to this young man. He's a young man in his, uh, his late 20s. And he said, oh, I see you're reading the Bible. And so the young man said, yeah, I am. And so, you know, I, I finished up what I was doing, and I came and I sat down, and I, and I looked at the young guy, and I said to him, um, what are you reading? Reading the Bible, what are you reading? He says, oh, I'm reading Galatians. I said, great. I said, you know, why? <laughs> why? And he says, you know, I just, he says, I feel a call to be a pastor and I'm just reading the Word of God. And I said, oh, that's great. And he said, that's really, and he looks at me, he says, I think I know who you are. And he says, who are you? <laughs> I said, that, I've been asking myself that for 58 years, man, I still don't know. <laughs> he says, aren't you the pastor over there? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I tr try to be. He goes, oh, and so for the next two hours, we talked about the things of the Lord for the next two hours with this young man, 28 years old. And he had a situation he was sharing with us. He said, you know, he goes, maybe, uh, well, you're pastors. He says, can I ask you a question? And I said, no, nah, I'm off the clock. No, I, <laughs> I said, come to Bible study tomorrow night. No, I said, of course, of course, you know. what?" He, so he starts asking some questions and, and and, and we, so Randy and I began to share with him and minister to him and talk to him, and it, we had a great time. But one of the things that he was asking was about the power of the Word of God. And I shared with him something. I shared with him this. I said, you know, I was in my early 20s, and I hit the wall spiritually. And when I hit the wall, I went into a, a tailspin that was so incredible that I stopped, I didn't leave my room for days. I, I went through depression that was extremely heavy. I said I wouldn't leave. I said I would actually sit in my room with my back on the wall, just with my back against the wall, and I wouldn't leave the room. And I, my sister Madeline, who's four years younger than I, would come and, and would sit down next to me. And I cried all day long for days. I, I, I went through something so heavy that I just, I just began to weep. And, and my, my sister would come in and just sit next to me. She never really said anything other than she'd pray, and she just cried with me. And I was sharing this with this young guy. I said, I was in my early 20s when this happened. I said, it just hit the wall spiritually. I was teaching Bible studies, going to Biola. I was doing a variety of things at that time. But, but I went through a crisis of faith that was very severe. I said, and then one day, I said, this had been going on for some time. I said, one day, 
I was in my parents' living room, actually the den, and I had the Bible, and I opened it up to the Gospel of John. And I said, and as I began to read the Gospel of John, I was in chapter 6, I got to the place where Jesus began to say, unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And, and that caused those who were at that time following him to be stumbled. Does this offend you is how Jesus speaks to them. No. And so he says, this, he says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And as Jesus was ministering to these people, and I'm reading this, they began to melt away. They began to walk away. They left him there. And then Jesus turns, and there's his disciples. And he asked them a question. He said to them, do you also want to go away? I said, when I was reading the Bible, I remember reading that phrase there, do you also want to go away? I said, and I closed the Bible, and I put it on my lap, and I began to speak to the Lord in prayer, and I said to him, where can I go? I have no friends. I got saved, and now that I became a Jesus freak, nobody wants to hang around with me. I said, I, I gave everything up, and I remember weeping and crying and calling out to God, saying, Lord, I've got nobody. Where can I go? I have no friends. I've got nothing. I'm going to Bible college because I want to be a pastor, and, and, and now I don't even qualify. My, my, I don't even have the faith to trust you anymore. And I remember weeping to the Lord, and I opened up the Bible again, and then the apostle Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And when I read that, God's Word brought a healing to my heart starting that day. It's His Word that brings you comfort. My friends tried to speak and talk me out of the pain. My mom, my dad couldn't stand seeing me the way I was. My sister would be there next to me just sobbing, weeping next to me. Nobody could help. It's the Word of God that brings comfort. It's God's Word. And, and what is sad is, is we look for the Word of men to make us happy and satisfied and blessed and entertained and, and, and everything else when it's God's Word that brings comfort. And that's why the angel said, remember what he said. Because you're going through something so heavy right now, you think that Jesus is dead, gone forever, and you need to remember what he said. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day he's going to rise from the dead. You need to remember what he said. And that's what your healing comes from. That's where it comes from. That's how you are healed. It comes through God's Word. I've said as a pastor many times, I can't heal you, but I know somebody who can. I know somebody who can. The same one who healed me can heal you. It's Jesus. Sometimes people say, Pastor, you know, I wish that you could, you could help me. I wish I could too, but I know who can. The same one who helps me, his name is Jesus, and he's alive. He's not a dead teacher. This isn't a philosophy. These aren't just words on a book that really have nothing to do with us. 21 centuries later, these words are life. And, and that's what brings them to peace, and that's what will bring you to peace. And, and that's why we read the Word every day. That's why we meditate on His Word. That's why we memorize His Word. That's why we do that, because that's how God brings to us the peace that we need so desperately. And so as he says that, verse 8, they remembered His words, then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. Their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. See, they remembered his words. Jesus had taught them that he would be resurrected, but they didn't understand it didn't make sense yet. Remember in Mark chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, 
how it says there, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept his word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. They didn't understand that. It was something yet to, to be revealed to them, but now it makes sense. And so what did they do? Well, verse 9 says they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. What they did is they went and made mention of what had happened. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles for a moment with me to John chapter 20. I want to illustrate this in John chapter 20. If you turn there for a moment, please. And I want to refresh your memory because John 20 records how, how Peter and John responded to this. Peter and John, verse 4, John 20, verse 4. They both ran together the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. John outran Peter. And, and he, stopped stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So both of them run to the tomb. Both of them see the linen cloths lying there. And both see that the tomb is empty. Yet here in John's gospel, only John is mentioned as having believed. Now, why would it be only John who is saying, and, and he saw and he believed? Well, one reason that could be is because Peter may still be dealing with his recent sin. Remember that the apostle Peter had said to the Lord Jesus Christ, though all forsake you, yet I never will forsake you. I would even die for you. He had made this boastful claim that, that he was a, a notch above the average person, much more so than the rest of those who followed him, and, and he's dealing with this. He had denied the Lord Jesus Christ because when it came down to it, and there he was denying the Lord three times, he hadn't forgotten what he did. So it would, it would seem that the shadow of his sin clouded his spiritual sight because sin clouds your sight. When you've got sin that you're dealing with, you don't see clearly. The Bible makes it clear. In Psalm 40, verse 12, troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me. I can't see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails within me. Your, your sins can cloud your sight. You don't see. It, 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 that's what happened. And, and sins can be the only thing that you do see. And what happens is you get distressed. You get laden with sin. You get laden with sorrow. You become unable to function. You get filled with sadness. And that's what your life is like because you don't have the joy. You don't have the, that sense of God's presence with you. You don't have the peace that comes through a relationship with Him. And it becomes just a terrible place to be. The psalmist in Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of, of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the guilt of my sin. That's what happens. That's what happens when you go to the Lord and you say, God, I'm drying up inside. I'm withering within. I, I have a need for life, and only you can bring that. God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. God, I need you. You see, Peter couldn't, couldn't fathom what had happened. Peter had forgotten so many things. But I would think that the main thing that the Apostle Peter forgot is he forgot how much God loved him. He forgot. That's easy. On one occasion, one of my kids came and shared something with me that was very painful. And I remember saying, there's nothing you can do that would ever make me not love you. Nothing. You're mine. You're my baby. I'll always love you. You know, love heals. Love heals. And God's love heals you. God's love heals you. 
Peter forgot how much God loved him. His sin clouded his vision, and he forgot how deeply God loved him. What happened with him is he was filled with self-condemnation. He was filled with his grief, and he had forgotten that Jesus had said, Come unto me, all you are laden, burdened and heavy laden. Come unto me, I will give you rest. He had forgotten that. And so as he's looking in that tomb, and, and there's, there's no body there, John looking in isn't dealing with, isn't grappling with the same kinds of things that the Apostle Peter is dealing with. John walks away believing because he knew God was true to his word. John and Peter saw the exact same thing. They saw an empty tomb, but each had a different point of view. But as they're looking at that tomb, something happens. Back in Luke 24, verse 12, Peter arose and ran to the tomb, stooping down. He saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. He departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Suddenly, like a bolt of lightning, he sees what happened. Jesus had risen, just like he had said he would. And he now experiences something, an awareness that God is true to his word. And he's seeing something right in front of him, Jesus' words taking flesh. The psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. That's why later on, when the apostle Peter was writing his first letter, he said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. We don't have the vantage point of the Apostle Peter and those who were first century saints. We have yet to see the physically risen Christ, but we do believe that he has been raised from the dead. And we are living testimonies of the reality of the newness of life that you can have through faith in Christ. Because Jesus Christ, when he raised from the dead, paid for our sins, also made it possible for us to have, have a, a love and a joy and a peace and, and a sense of his presence uh, that passes all human understanding. And we have a relationship with him because he's alive. And so on this first Easter, this resurrection morning, the apostle Peter was actually experiencing something that would cause him later on to become the man that he became through his faith and relationship to Jesus Christ. And even though he had denied him at one point, he never denied him again because the Lord worked in him even as he can work in us.